Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. As often happens with this show, one guest is referred by a previous guest. And my guest today is Laura Delhauer, who is the co-author of The Vegetated Table with previous guest, Marissa miller Wolfson, And she is gonna be cooking a wonderful lentil soup for us. Please welcome Laura to the show. It's very nice to meet you. Hi, Chef AJ, so nice to meet you. Yeah, I, I can't wait to learn more about you, but I know that your recipe takes a little bit of time to cook. So if you'd like to just get started with the recipe and then we'll learn more about your plant-based journey and how you got involved with this wonderful book. Sure, that's perfect. Yeah, this is uh, Laura's Lovely Lentils from uh, page 152 of the Vegetated Family Table. So this is our recipe. And uh, yeah, we'll just dive right in. Um, I will say up front that if you have the book or if you get the book, it's a wonderful book. Uh, it does say at the beginning um, that we that we do cook the veggies at the beginning in some oil, but we're not going to do that today. And we do mention in our book, you can do all of this with broth or water when it comes to this, this kind, well, any of our recipes really, but um, especially when it comes to soups and stews. So that's what we're going to start out with today. Um, because the recipe is so simple to make, I um, kind of, I, I would have chopped everything ahead of time, but I thought we'll chop a little bit together so that we can, um, yep. so that we can have, have more to do. Um, plus, if you ever want to cook along, you can come back and chop with me. This is my compost bowl that all my like onion skins and stuff are going in, but we're just going to have two, uh, two carrots one yellow onion and three stalks of celery that we're gonna chop up and put in here. So I'll get to that. Right I hear here. something funny, Laura. I literally opened the book. I'm not kidding. I didn't know what you were making. I opened the book and this is the page it opened to. That's funny. I thought, okay, I wonder if it's like, no, it's not even perfectly halfway through because my book always yeah. opens to this, but I thought it's because this is the recipe I probably make most in the book. I love that. Funny. I love that you're using simple, easy to find ingredients. And I see fire roasted tomatoes on your counter. I love those by Muir Glenn. Yes, I love these too. And so I know the book, and I'll talk about this a little more in a bit if you'd like. Um, the book is for plants, like uh, it's the first ever cookbook that's for raising plant-based children, but it's not all kids recipes. Like it's all kid friendly recipes, but I make these for my family, for my boyfriend, for myself. Um, so a lot of them I have little tweaks to make them a little more grown up and one of the things that I really like to do when I'm when there aren't any kiddos around when I'm making these is um Muir Glen has a fire roasted tomato with medium green chilies in it these are really good I don't know how you feel about spice I love I like spice but not everybody. I like spice my husband lot. doesn't so we have to make it bland and then I have to add oh that can be hard that yeah. can be hard that's real love though if, you, <laughs> if you're a spice lover and you love a non-spice lover yeah, so I use these, but if you do have kiddos around, I just had to show um, these are crushed or you could get diced, just plain fire roasted tomatoes. That works too. If you don't want to use canned tomatoes, you want to use fresh tomatoes, that's okay. I just really like the flavor of the fire roasted tomatoes. Yes, there's, it's so good. I think so too. Um, so yeah, so I'm just going to chop up the rest of our onion. I also like that when, uh, when I'm not using oil, I find that because the onion won't caramelize quite as much, but what really, really makes up for it perfectly is to add a little bit of garlic powder and or onion powder uh, when the vegetables are simmering in the broth. And to me, that makes all the difference. So that's not in the recipe, but I will be adding it today. Yeah, I think it's great when you combine dried spices with, with fresh herbs and spices. I think so too. And we also don't, because we know some people, we do have garlic, raw garlic in some of our recipes, but we do know that some, um, you know, especially little ones can be really sensitive to garlic. A lot of people can be sensitive to garlic. Uh, so this recipe doesn't say that it calls for garlic, but I will oftentimes add in a, a fresh clove of garlic as well. So we have some sort of roughly chopped yellow onion here. You could also use a white onion. Um, I wouldn't normally use a red onion, but I have done it in a pinch and it's totally fine. That works too. And 
while I chop up the celery and carrots, I will turn this on. Sweat my hands real quick. I will turn this on like a medium high heat and throw in maybe about a quarter cup of broth. You could do low sodium broth or homemade broth, whatever works for you. Um, and when that simmers a little bit, I will throw in the onions. I, uh, for a couple of years now, have been trying to be single use plastic free. And so um, I like better than bouillon a lot because it's, uh, I don't have, there, there's no plastic wrapping, there's no plastic packaging, and I don't have to get boxes and boxes of broth. Although I do really enjoy making my own broth. I just don't always do it. I make a lot of things from scratch, but it doesn't always work out to do everything from scratch. But um, this does have a, a decent amount of sodium in it. So if you're sensitive to sodium or avoiding sodium, there is a low sodium one, or you can do a different kind of broth, but this is just something that I like to avoid plastic and I like the flavor. Yep. When you make your own broth, do you make it in the Instant Pot? Uh, yeah, I have done it in, in a crock pot, an Instant Pot. Um, I've also just done it on a really low simmer for hours and hours on the stovetop. Uh, that's what I learned to do. I went, uh, I attended the Gerson Institute in San Diego where we were working with, um, it was Nutrition for Healing. We were working with cancer patients and everything that we did there was like very, very simple, no salt, no, you know, whatever. And, uh, and I, that's where I learned to make broth for the first time. And, and so for a while I was just doing stovetop and someone brought up to me, why don't you do it in the crock pot? Pot, it's easier and yes that works really well but the Gerson Institute was it 100 percent plant-based no salt oil and sugar no salt oil sugar um it was entirely plant-based except for Dr. Gerson um who uh, I don't remember what year he died but he died a very long time ago uh he at the time that he developed the um the uh program and and the and his his um, treatments, uh, there was a concern about too much alkalinity um, and not enough acidity. So one of the suggestions that he has as an option for uh, for adding some acidity to your to your diet is to um, is to use uh, a little bit of plain yogurt. But I found that that is definitely like I think that the science that's come out since then really implies that there are many other ways that you could be adding a little bit of acidity like some beans um, and things like that as opposed to having to um, add any animal product the most most of the of the diet all of the diet except for that one little thing as an option um, is completely plant-based yes yeah. I'm guessing they didn't probably do alcohol and coffee there either. No, no alcohol, no coffee, herbal teas only. And um, lots of, they do a lot of juicing um, is as part of the, the regimen, uh, but it's mostly soups and, and it's like the, the things that your body can absorb nutrients from as quickly as possible. Thanks. Yeah. I'm gonna throw our onions into the pot. This is getting nice and warm. Here we go. I'm going to give that a little stir. Have you ever made this in the Instant Pot? What? Have you ever made this in the Instant Pot? I haven't, but my old roommate did, and that's how she always makes this, and it works perfectly well. I just, Marisa teases me because I like doing things the hard way because I, that was the only option I had for a long time. I never had a crock pot or, a, or an Instant Pot, and I never had um, like a, like a standing mixer or even a hand mixer. So ever, like ever, all baking and everything, I do everything with a fork. And Maurice is like, use a, like at least a hand mixer. And I don't, but <laughs> yes, but crock pot or um, into pot works really, really well for this. Um, so I'm gonna chop up a last, the last of our vegetables really quick. You could use other vegetables. I find that the, uh, where did my bowl go? Oh, there we go. Um, I find that the, uh, Carrots, celery, and onions is like a perfect uh, combination, but you could definitely do add other vegetables. You could add peas, um, especially if you're cooking for a family with picky eaters or, or, or little kids uh, who, are, who might be pickier. If they have a favorite vegetable, I always recommend adding 
a child's favorite vegetable to any dish just because they recognize it and they love it. Uh, most children, I, 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 in my experience, don't love mushrooms, but Marisa's daughter's favorite vegetable uh, is mushrooms. At least it was. Uh, I know kids' taste changes, but mushrooms would be great in this. Do all kinds of things. So, there well, carrot, celery, and onion, isn't that what they call mirepoix? Sorry? Carrot, celery, and onion, is they call it mirepoix. Yes, 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 they do. They do. Um, and we got that. Our carrots. Oh, and then I'll do my celery. Last but not least. I, I will say the one thing that I added to this once that I changed my mind on, I love broccoli. Broccoli is one of my favorite vegetables, but uh, I did find that I didn't love, because I, I especially love this, um, like all soups and stews, I feel like they're great the first day, but they're the best the second day when all the flavors have had time to really meld together. And uh, so that was, oh, so once when I added broccoli, I found that, you know, it was in the refrigerator overnight, but you know that way that cruciferous vegetables can kind of give off a bit of a smell. I found that that kind of, it, it didn't taste bad, but I didn't love the, the smell of the whole thing the next day as much as I do when I just use these veggies, these veg and a, uh, and my tomatoes. I was, I'm wondering how a sweet potato might be in there. Ooh, a sweet potato would be great. I've used um, red skin potatoes and, uh, and I don't think I've ever done it with sweet potatoes. I've been making this recipe for so many years. Um, but I mean, before it came out in the book, it was just mine that I did all the time and did many variations of, but uh, I'm gonna have to try that. Sweet potato would be great, would be great. Okay, so our onions are, and again, I used a quarter cup of broth um, just to get these tender at the beginning, but you could definitely use water. Uh, that would be fine too. Okay. And you could also use more veggies. So we say, uh, you know, everything in here is a little bit catering to kiddos that um, might be pickier eaters or, uh, you know, be overwhelmed by a lot of veggies. And so this is a good amount of veggies, um, the whole onion, three stalks of celery and two carrots, uh, but, and then our fire roasted tomatoes. But uh, if you wanted to, I've definitely done this where I added five carrots and five stalks of celery. Can't go wrong with more veggies. You know, a lot of times people really don't give their kids credit for recipes like this. They just think of like kid food, like, you know, chicken yeah. nuggets or NP and kids will eat a healthy, delicious soup like this. If they it's really will. And even if, um, I mean, for me, I find that if you don't tell them like, this is a really healthy meal, it's like, just tell them like, this is yummy or eat it in front of them. They'll want to try it. I nannied for a little boy years ago who um, was absolutely not plant-based at all, but he would have his food that his mom set up for him to eat um, that I was supposed to, you know, give to him. And then he'd see me eating something different. And so he always wanted to eat what I was eating. And so he ate lentils and black beans and broccoli. And, you know, he, he was left, you know, his, his mom gave him lots of vegetables, but she would leave hot dogs and stuff like that for him to eat. And he would never eat the hot dogs. He'd eat my black beans instead. So definitely got to give kids more credit. Absolutely. And kids develop taste preferences for what they habitually eat. So when they're served healthy food from an early age, they develop a taste for it. Absolutely. And that was our goal with the book was the idea of like setting up foundational, even if parents aren't raising their kids entirely plant-based, it's a great book for introducing your kids to whole foods, plant-based, uh, whole, whole food, plant-based food, uh, that they, that are really comforting and enjoyable to eat, but very healthy. I'm gonna add my celery and carrots. Throw these in. Because so many of these foods are, you know, Marisa's children, uh, Gabriel and Emily, these are their comfort foods, you know? And 
doesn't mean that they don't occasionally like the more indulgent vegan foods, but uh, there's a lot of things in here. We have, um, I just actually made, we have a, we call it a baby's first smash cake. And uh, it's a gluten-free, refined sugar-free, um, sweetened with dates uh, cake. And I, it's my favorite cake I've ever made. And I made it for my mom's birthday a couple of weeks ago. And my whole family loves it. So now, did your mom smash it just the way a one-year-old? You know, she didn't. She didn't. But that would have been hilarious. <laughs> um, I am going to add in, these should just simmer, simmer till they get a little bit tender. Uh, so for like three or four minutes, but I am going to add in uh, just like a little, maybe like half a teaspoon of some garlic granules and onion granules as well. What's the difference between granules and powder? Is it just how finely it's ground? It's just how fine it's ground. This still, this says garlic ground, this says onion powder but it is granules, but then I also have an onion powder that's really powdery. I prefer the granules personally. Um, also, maybe it's partially because I, I do find that I get more flavor out of them, but I also find that um, because if I pour my spices over the, the heat, then like the steam come, goes up into them and they clump and, and uh, go bad faster. So I always pour things in my hand or in a teaspoon first. Uh, and when I do that with the powder in my hands, I find that it gets messier and I just like the granules, but in a pinch you could use either, it's fine. <clears throat> Give those a stir. Yeah, this perfect blend of veggies is always one of the best smells in the kitchen when you have this all together. So while those are getting a little bit tender as soon as those are a little bit tender, I'm going to add in the fire roasted tomatoes and then it'll be four cups of broth that we add. Uh, now I, I did the better than bouillon, which is a teaspoon of this per cup of water. Uh, but I just put for the sake of, uh, for the sake of showing in, in this, I just put all of the teaspoons of broth that I'm going to need in here and then I'll fill this up with more water and just put water in but that's also another option if you want a little bit of broth but you don't want too much broth or you, you can't get low sodium broth you could just do instead of four cups of broth two cups of broth and two cups of water and then you've created low sodium broth nice so I'll do that and you can use uh any kind of lentils with this recipe the original recipe was with brown lentils. I think we say brown or green. Yeah, we say brown or green, two cups of brown or green lentils in the book. But uh, I find I, I love it with all kinds of lentils. Brown are my favorite because I think brown lentils to me are like a little, they, they get a little more savory, whereas green are a little earthier, but they taste very similar. So that's just me having made these a million times. Uh, but you could do, I have green today because that's just because that's what I have, but I'll also often do a, a combination of green and red or brown and red. Uh, if you're just using red, it'll be a completely different soup because anyone who has not done all the different lentils, uh, red lentils do have a very different taste um, and they will break down and become mushier, whereas these will stay whole but get really big and soft. So, yes. Nice. I'm gonna go ahead and throw in our. I, do you don't you find that the red lentils cook a little bit quicker usually? Oh yes, thank you for that. Um, yes, and the red lentils will absolutely cook much quicker. Uh, I find that if I cook some, you know, I've done like half a cup of red lentils in with a cup of half cup and a half of brown or green, and. I still cooked everything the same amount of time and the red lentils weren't overcooked. It was all fine and wonderful together. But if you're just doing red lentils, yes, the red lentils, this whole thing cooks in about 40, 45 minutes, depending on your stove. But the, uh, the um, red lentils would cook in like 20, 25 minutes closer to that. So if you're, if you're in a hurry and you only have, and you have different kinds of lentils, 
red would definitely be faster. But this is a great recipe that you, once you get everything in the pot, there's really not much that you need to do. So it's a great recipe to, I'm a huge fan of soups and stews that make a lot of food. So it's kind of like a great meal prep too. Uh, but also once you get everything in the pot or the instant pot, and then you just set it, leave it, and you know, don't leave the kitchen for a long period of time when you got a flame on, but uh, you can do other things. So that's always good. And you like to freeze your soups ever? Yes, I do. Um, I find that I, well, when I was living by, not by myself, but with uh, roommates and I was single, I definitely uh, did that a lot. Now that I am always either with family or with my partner who eats a lot, uh, we tend to go through all the soup and, and lentils and things like that in a week. But um, when I would make, I, I never made smaller batches of things. I love making the larger batches so you don't have to make it over and over again. So I'll make large batches of this. And when I am only cooking for one or two, I will, because uh, this recipe makes so much food, so much food. This is, I will make this at the, at, at, at the, week, at the head of the week, at the beginning of the week. And uh, we'll have it because you can do so many different things with it too. It's more stewy than soupy. So it's not, it's not really brothy once all the lentils absorb all the liquid. And so it's a soup. We call a soup, a soup and a stew. It's a stoop. A stoop. I love that. I'm going to start saying that. So this is a lentil stoop. And uh, so I will even, uh, you know, after it's been in the fridge for a day or so, I'll heat some up in a pan where I don't get a lot of the liquid in the pan. And then I'll put them on like uh, some toast or something like that, like some sourdough toast, or you could put it on on veggies, or I, I do it with uh, baked potato. Baked potato is a big thing at Gerson Institute, uh, but they didn't put butter or oil or anything on it. We would just put uh, like simmered vegetables over the potatoes and things like that. So I like this like that too. Nice. So I'd love to hear your personal story when you became plant-based, why? Oh, for sure. Let me just, I'll throw in the lentils and then I'll tell you. Uh, yeah, you can't forget your lentils and lentil stoop. That would be bad. So he, here's my green lentils. It looks like a lot, or from where I'm standing, this looks like a ton, but it's only two cups and they will get much bigger and it, it will be a ton of food. So I'm going to go ahead and add these in. All right, and those were coming out of my colander. They're nicely rinsed. And then I'm gonna add in my four cups of broth. There's two. And I'm just gonna add water for the rest. Two. I missed, back in New York, I had this wonderful uh, measuring cup that was a silicone one that could have, you could fill it with four cups. And I miss that so much because when you have the two cup, you have to refill it. That's okay. Oh, so you, you left it in New York? I did. I left it. And I was actually back there recently. And I, I did find some of my kitchen stuff uh, in my, I have a storage unit that I put a bunch of my kitchen stuff in. And, uh, and I did look for some things, but I didn't take everything out and get everything because I only came with a small suitcase and... Yeah, I'm thinking of doing a road trip out there and then packing up my car with uh, with some of the things I'd like to have out here. Not sure yet. Not sure where I'll land after everything resumes. I guess a lot is resuming, but I'm still I'm still in pandemic mode emotionally anyway. Okay, so I've got everything in: four cups of broth, two cups of lentils a can of fire roasted tomatoes, my carrots, my onion, my celery, and yeah, that was it. Uh, so that's all in there. I'm gonna, we can chat while we wait for that to come to a boil. I am turning the heat up a bit so that that'll come to a boil faster. And you cook um, it uncovered. What? Uncovered, right? Yeah, yeah, uncovered. And then once uh, it does boil, I'll put it to a simmer and then I will cover it. Nice. Yeah. Well, well, you look like you're just out of high school or college, so I'd love to know why you became plant-based and when. I appreciate that. Um, maybe we'll, we'll thank the plant-based plant diet for that because I'm not just out of high school or college. Um, but 
I, uh, I went, I went vegan. Well, I started experimenting with veganism, I should say about 10 years ago. And, uh, it'll be my 10 year. See, I'm not, well, I think I'm, I'm going to celebrate my 10 year anniversary on the day that I like last ever ate meat is I guess the day I'll celebrate. But, uh, the, the month that I started experimenting with veganism and went primarily vegan was, uh, August of 2011. So it'll be 10 years in August. And, uh, my, I was going through a divorce and I was having like emotional stuff going on. And I had a family member who I was really close to, who is sort of my support system during, during that time, who was having a lot of physical, um, illness stuff that he was dealing with. And a friend, uh, recommended to both of us that something that could be a cool project for us to to experiment with would be cutting out animal products because it would be so much gentler on his organs. His kidneys were having a lot of problems and stuff. And, uh, and she said, you know, it'd just be a cool thing for you guys to do together while you're both kind of going through a hard time. And so I was really open to trying just about anything uh, at that time. And so we did it for a month together. And we also did, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Schulz. Dr. Dr. Richard Schultz? Richard Schultz, yeah. I remember him from Marina Del Rey. He had a store. Yes, 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 exactly. Uh, he does a lot of cleanses um, and like he has, he has a, an herbal cleanse for all the major organs. And he said that while you're doing the cleanses, you should be entirely plant-based. And I didn't understand why, but I was like, okay. And uh, so the two of us, did a few of the cleanses. Those were also recommended to us, especially for his kidneys, do a kidney cleanse. And uh, yeah, so, so we did the cleanses and we both felt a million times better, had so much energy at the end of that month. And I just thought, why? You know, I don't understand why that would make such a difference and all of that. So I started researching. I found the Forks Over Nines documentary, which I found fascinating and wonderful. And I just thought, you know, there's so many reasons why initially very focused on the health element of it but i just thought there's so many reasons to do this i i feel like i should at least predominantly eat this way uh or learn to eat this way because at the time i didn't cook at all and i had no idea what i was doing and there was a lot of eating sourdough toast with sauteed stir-fried vegetables because that's all i knew was vegan uh but and smoothies lots and lots of green smoothies and that kind of thing but eventually I started figuring things out and experimenting with different foods and discovered that I actually ate so many more foods once I went plant-based and yeah, so I really stuck with it, but I was sort of still, I know a lot of people do the like vegetarian and then vegan. I didn't do that. I was, I was more like a six day a week vegan at first. And then I had a day a week that I was like, I could have whatever I want, but as very quickly as, I started doing more research. I thought, I don't know if I want that like cheat day or whatever. And then especially once I delved into learning about factory farms, I was done. I was just done, done, done. Uh, and the environmental element of it really took over um, a few years later when I started really learning more about climate change and now I do climate activist work and environmental um, activism. And I actually have a theater company that's predominantly, uh, we make environmentally focused theater. Uh, my background's in comedy also, so I do- Really, wait a minute, now you're talking my language. I well, that's right, you do stand-up, right? Yeah, that's amazing. So tell me what environmentally conscious theater is. So I've kind of made it up, um, but it was something that I really cared about. I was doing theater in New York but I was also doing plant-based cooking and I, I was cooking uh, for Marisa's family and, and, and then cooking for myself and experimenting with recipes and stuff on my own. And then Marisa asked me to write the cookbook with her and that was really exciting. But I felt like I wasn't, I cared so much about the environmental, not just environmental aspects of veganism, but environmentalism in general. And I felt like you know, I'd go to protests and things like that, but I just felt like I, and, and I was vegan and I was promoting plant-based living, but I, I'm not on a huge scale. And I just couldn't figure out 
you know, I didn't want to abandon theater. I had been doing theater since I was eight years old and it was the most important thing in the world to me. And then the next most important thing in the world to me, besides the people in my life who I love were, was environmentalism. And I kind of had, I had a friend slash mentor who I was having a, a dinner with and I was sort of freaking out. And I said, you know, I've got theater and I've got environmentalism and I, and I just don't, I don't know how to give them both enough attention. And he just sort of leaned over the table and put my hands together. And at the time, neither of us knew what he meant by that, but it was just what he impulsively wanted to do. And that was it. And I just was like, I'm going to start making environmental theater a thing because the only time I ever really saw environmentalism talked about in theater was very angry and very luxury. And that's not always very inviting to everyone. If you're preaching to your choir, people can be into that. But I find that humor really cracks people open. And um, my, I, I don't do stand up. I admire so much people who do stand up, but I've done sketch comedy stuff and um, a lot of uh, comedic theater background. And uh, my grandfather was a writer for the Carol Burnett show and uh, the, the Jackie. Oh my Gibson. God, that's amazing. Yeah, he, uh, he won an Emmy for writing on the Carol Burnett show. He also wrote for the Jackie Gleason show. And is, he still alive? is he still alive? No, sadly, no. Oh my gosh, I would have loved to have him on the show. I that, that's fantastic. He's I love wonderful. The that show. Oh, he was a great guy, and uh, and I love those shows. And so we grew up on. Um, he was very. Uh, I, I'm I'm sad that I only had him in my life till I was 19, but I'm so glad that he set my foundation for um, a very high standards for comedy, <laughs> and I really love uh, comedy and theater. And uh, yeah, I thought uh, let's, I, I sort of wanted to amplify the voices of the, what I called the characters of climate change because there's so many perspectives and not perspectives as in, is it real or is it not? Like, I don't want to mess with that. Like it's real, it's happening. But uh, perspective, like the perspective of, you know, someone who lives in America in a certain community versus a different community, someone who lives on an island that's going underwater, someone who, uh, you know, works in some of these industries that are causing the problem, but they're also just trying to put food on the table for their families. And they, you know, they don't like their perspective was, I felt like a, a character that we weren't really hearing in any of the stories about this. It was all just like villainizing or like, these are the heroes and these are the villains. And it's never that simple. So, and then I wanted the perspective of the animals. So we have, uh, basically I started this whole monologue series. So I have all these different playwrights and we write all of these different, we've written all these different stories from perspectives of different uh, characters of climate change. And one of them is a sea turtle who's, uh, because sea turtles are going in, uh, going extinct and uh, are, are critically endangered. And, uh, and so we wanted the perspective of the sea turtle, but she's like one of the funniest characters in the show. And she's this awkward, nerdy, a uh, sea turtle who just wants people to, you know, stop messing with the planet, but but it's not done in a luxury kind of way. It's just telling her story. And then we have an orangutan from Sumatra who tells his story, and uh, he's like a he's like an anger management for his frustration with what's happening to the planet. And uh, yeah, so our show is called Hi Mom: Monologues from the Characters of Climate Change, and that's that's been my main focus other than this cookbook for the last three years. Well, it sounds like you inherited the comedy gene. Where can we see this performance that you So talked? I, uh, Laura, at my, my website, lauradelhower.com, we will soon have clips of the show up there and there will always be information about when the show will be happening again. Uh, right now, because of COVID and everything, theater sort of shut down and, uh, you know, it's, slowly but surely coming back. But the only for sure performance that we have on the books coming up is in September in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Uh, we'll be doing uh, portions of the show at a, a wonderful climate event uh, in Red Hook on a barge on the water, which will be really fun. Uh, and so that information will all be on my website, lauradelhauer.com. Nice. Hey, you know what I want to know is how did you get involved with this book? Oh yeah, so I was so I was basically working with Marisa's family as a personal chef, and but also Marisa and I instantly when we met and talked about working together, or talking about me working for them, 
very quickly we were like we're best friends like we we both have the comedy gene and we both uh have slightly dark senses of humor and uh love children love food and all the things and really quickly we hit it off by the way i'm starting to boil here so i'm just going to give this a little stir and then lower to a simmer and cover this guy and i'm going to set my timer i always set it for about 20 minutes I'll do 25 minutes uh, and then check it. We may uh, need a little more time after that. Uh, we say about 45 minutes in the book, but it, it can vary on different stoves. You definitely want to check it after about 25 minutes and it's lentils and it's soup. So you know what it looks like. So it's okay if we don't finish it on the show, but I'll be able to show you the softened lentils. Nice. Yeah. And the, the Gerson Institute, that's fascinating. How did you get hooked up with them? Yeah, so um, after I watched Forks Over Knives, um, I really started following a lot of the different individuals who were featured in Forks Over Knives. And I'm trying to remember who it was, but like through that, and then I found Chris Carr, and then I found uh, just a bunch of different wonderful, you know, vegan activists and, 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 and Marisa making Vegucated and all of these people. Um, and as I started following different people, I started finding other documentaries that they were in. And so I eventually found Food Matters, um, the documentary Food Matters. And I know that not everyone involved in that is exclusively vegan, but everyone's, I, I think, predominantly plant-based or plant-based focused. Um, but a lot of them are, are vegan, entirely plant-based and whole foods plant-based. And uh, Dr. Gerson's daughter, Charlotte Gerson was in that documentary. I, I'm trying to remember because there was Food Matters and then there was Hungry for, Hungry for Change. They were made both made by the Food Matters team. And I don't remember for sure if, if Charlotte was in both of them, but whichever one I saw first, I saw Charlotte Gerson speaking and, and she just spoke. She was in her late 80s, I want to say, when she was making that, when she was in that documentary. And she just spoke from this beautiful grounded place about how we heal the body and as much as I had become so immersed in in a passion for environmentalism and animal rights uh, and human rights uh, when it comes to the subject of, of animal agriculture and everything my brain still is fascinated with the nutrition side of it and so uh, when she was talking about how we're healing people's bodies of cancer with food i was absolutely my my mind was completely blown and uh i just thought i wanted to see what they were talking about in person and unfortunately in the united states as you probably are aware um it's not legal to treat cancer with anything other than uh radiation uh chemo or uh surgery so they can't administer treatment with the gerson therapy in the u.s they do administer it in Mexico and I think maybe France and Germany, but in the US you can learn the, the therapy and you can administer it yourself while working with someone virtually or maybe in person who can help be a guide. So I basically went and learned how to do that. I, I didn't have anyone in my family at the time who was um, suffering from cancer, thank goodness, but I just wanted to learn about it. And, and it wasn't just for that, but that was a big focus was um, keeping your body healthy or trying to rid toxins from your body when your body's really struggling with a major illness. And I went and there was about 70 people in the course. And the whole time we were there, they fed us and every day we ate uh, all Gerson food and, and juices and all of that and teas. But, uh, but a, what I was really surprised by was about half of the people in the class, in the course, were actually cancer patients themselves. And so to get to sit with them and talk to them about their experiences doing the sort of mainstream route or, you know, some of them had been through chemo, some of them had been through surgery and the cancer came back and they just, and some of them wanted to continue doing um, that route, but they wanted something else to support their immune system during it because chemo doesn't do that. You know, chemo's killing everything, not just the bad stuff. So the idea of being able to support their immune systems while their body was going through so much. And it was so, it was one of the most 
life-changing experiences to just sit there and watch these people be so determined to take charge of their health for the first time in their lives, mostly uh, for most of them. And so that was very inspiring and uh, just kept me going down this road. So nice. And so, so you, did you go to Mexico? I didn't go to Mexico. I went to San Diego. That's where they had the Institute that we, where we could um, learn. So you can learn it in America, but you just can't administer it uh, medically. Like what, kind of, what kind of miracles did you see happen with this therapy? Oh man. Um, so we had a bunch of people come in and speak to us who had been through the program. And it's a, I will say it is a, it is not for the faint of heart. It is a very um, intense program. There's a lot to it. And, um, you know, as, as much as I think some people can get really hung up on the rigidity of it, but one of my favorite people who, who spoke to us, I wish I could remember his name. He, he said, you know, I know they're going to tell you the way they told me, you know, you have to do it exactly this way and you have to drink the juices at these times and you have to, you know, every juice has to be fresh squeezed and immediately consumed for the best amount of nutrients and this and that. And he said, but I will tell you the, like the, one of the most important elements, if not the most important element of all of this really is your mindset. So if you are in a good headspace, but you're kind of like, sometimes you juice everything in the morning so that you can go to the beach with your kids still and their your juices are in a cooler with ice. That's not exactly the regimen, but I cured myself of cancer. I don't, you know, like I'm cancer free. I did this for three years, but I did it with flexibility, enough flexibility that my mental health was still good. And we had other people who talked about the fact that like the, there was a man whose wife was sort of his caregiver through all of it. And he was very weak. So she did everything. She did all the juicing, all the food preparation herself. And he didn't, uh, he didn't, wasn't able to help in any way. And their kids were off at school. So um, yeah, she didn't have any help. And it really took such a toll on her body, on her mental health, that eventually when he was starting to get stronger, he was able to help out. But until then, and these are, you know, very real things to talk about. Um, because I think that sometimes when we're trying to show people how wonderful something is, we can just try to depict it as perfect. Um, and that's not, that's not the case a lot of the time. Um, it's not perfect, but it's, it's very effective. And, and these were people, I think we spoke to maybe a, do, a dozen people who had been through the program and either had gone completely into remission or their bodies, they, they had surgery, like they'd had surgery and had come back, had surgery, came back had surgery after nine months on the Gerson therapy and then never came back, you know, and this was like five years later. And that kind of stuff was really inspiring. And it wasn't so rigid as like, you know, if, if your doctor says you need surgery, don't do surgery, just do the juicing and the this and that. It's like, you can combine the two, but you really need to listen to your body and what it needs. Um, and I, and I really love that element of reminding people about the mental health aspect because um, I think it's Chris Carr also who, yeah, I think it was, and I think it was on the Food Matters documentary. I remember hearing her say for the first time, your health is determined by what you eat, what you drink and what you think. And that what you think element, you know, I'm all about the what you eat and what you drink, but the what you think element is something that I took for granted for a long time. And um, especially last year with COVID and in the last few years, um, really taking care of our mental health is so important too. So yeah, nice. I learned a lot. Are you in touch with any of the people today? Um, just a couple of the people from the class uh, that, that, that took the class with me who um, were taking it. There were only three of us in the whole course who were taking it just for informational purposes, who didn't have someone we were specifically looking after and we weren't sick ourselves. Um, and the two of them and I still speak. And occasionally I email with one of the instructors from there. Yeah. Nice. What's your favorite recipe in this book? Oh, goodness. Uh, it's like asking to choose your favorite child. Well, I know. Everybody has a favorite kid, though. Let's face it. Let's be honest. <laughs> um, honestly, I will say this is one of them. The lentils, it seems so simple, but um, yeah, but it's, um, it's so versatile. You can use it with so many things. And, you know, that that's ever uh 
uh, persistent question of where do you get your protein um, drives me a little crazy, you know, drives us all a little bit crazy sometimes. And I, I was actually able to speak on a panel. Um, uh, there was, a, it was an online performance, art and activism, uh, environmental activism performance in December. And I was a little bit overwhelmed at first because I was like, ah, it's like everyone else on the panel is like a climate scientist and I'm an environmental theater maker and I cook. Um, and, but I, I was actually really um, sort of proud of myself that I, that I went on the panel because um, one of the things that came up when people were asking, you know, as individuals, what is the best thing we can do for climate change? And all of the climate scientists did say cutting out meat or cutting, cutting back on your meat consumption, you know, especially predominantly beef, but like everything. And, uh, the, you know, the less meat you can eat. And then someone asked the, um, one of the climate scientists, do you eat meat? And uh, one of, I think two of them didn't, and there were three of them, two of them didn't, and one did. And she said, I eat very little meat and I don't eat red meat, but um, she, the, her reasoning had to do with the way tofu is processed. And she said, you know, the, the carbon footprint of, you know, processing it. And then also like a lot of times it gets sent to China, processed in China and sent back and this and that. And while she's not incorrect about some of that, I, you know, someone asked me, you know, how do you feel about that? Cause they knew, everyone knew I was plant-based and a chef. And I said, well, um, I don't disagree with what she's saying. Uh, however, I don't think that makes chicken better. Um, and also, you know, you can, as much as you can have some soy products in your, in your diet, predominantly, I don't eat any of that. I eat lentils and lentils have so such a little, you know, footprint comparatively to any of this. So I think that we forget sometimes about lentils and beans as sources of protein. And, and to me, that's some of our best sources of protein, um, for the planet, for our bodies and everything. And so, um, yeah, lentil, I just, I just think at the end of the day, I really don't know anyone who's tried lentils and doesn't like lentils and you can make them really savory. You can make them very earthy. You can make them with all kinds of vegetables and they're just the perfect, I think they're the perfect food. So uh, this is probably maybe my favorite recipe, but that, that baby's first smash cake, which I make for all kinds of cake uh, or, or events, special events that's sweetened with dates and stuff. I, I do love that recipe. Um, yeah, there's so many, there's so many. I, I do have a bit of a sweet tooth. So I like our peanut butter cups too. That was one of my first vegan recipes I developed. Um, or they're almond butter cups in the book, but yeah, and lots of them. There, look at that, baby's first smash cake. Love that one. It's great. You know, one of the things people love to know about every guest, almost every guest I have had is what do you eat in a day? What do I eat? Like in a day, like what, what would a day's worth of food look oh, like? Oh, that's a great question. I always see those YouTube videos of what I eat in a day. And I think that's so fun. Um, I watch them all the time. So um, I really like, right now I'm on an Ezekiel toast kick. I like Ezekiel toast with uh, hummus in the morning. Um, and, but uh, if I'm not having that, I really like oatmeal uh, or like a green smoothie in the morning. And then lunches are usually something leftover, like I'll throw together some salad with like a bean or something that I have in the fridge made uh, or some lentils. Um, I love salads and then sometimes I accidentally, this definitely happened in the pandemic where I just stopped eating salads for like six months. And it was just a laziness, like wanted comfort food all the time. I don't wanna say laziness in a judgmental way. We were all going through a lot. But um, just, yeah, I didn't, I didn't for a while. Anytime I go back to them, like I recently have, I love salad um, and salads don't have to be boring. I love uh, roasted chickpeas in my salad um, or like bowls and things like that. Um, I really like tempeh, eat a lot of tempeh and lentils. And at nighttime, it's usually like a super stew. I love Mexican food, I have to say. I was born and raised in Southern California and 
the whole time I was in New York for 10 years, I missed Mexican. There's so much good food out there, but I miss Mexican food so much. And it's so easy to make Mexican food vegan. So getting like black bean burritos and tacos and stuff like that is, that's my jam. Nice. Do you exercise a lot? Um, I do exercise. Again, during the pandemic, I'd say not a lot. My, my new uh, greatest love is daily jump roping. Um, I really love jump roping. I love, uh, I have a rebounder as well. And I really love that. Um, but yeah, I just recently got back into uh, a pretty regular exercise regime. Um, I do ballet uh, videos on YouTube uh, or from YouTube um, for like strength training because I really like that, that kind of strength training. Um, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of yoga with Adrian right now. So I, I hear great things about her. Maybe I can get her on the show. Yeah. I hear she's, Oh, wonderful. she's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. How's your soup coming along? Soup is coming along. So we can, we can check this now actually. Yeah. So our, our lentils are, let me see if I can bring this towards you. Our lentils are still definitely, um, a little on the small and hard side. Um, you definitely want them to be real soft when you bite into them. And these you can tell from looking at them, maybe not on the camera as much, but you can tell by looking at them, they're, they're still pretty small. They'll get a lot softer and, and they'll get bigger. Um, but it smells amazing in my kitchen. I always wish I could send the smell towards you. Um, but there's still also a lot of liquid in here. And because this is a, what do we say, a stoop? Stoop, a combination stoop. A stoop, yes, a stoop. Yeah. Um, there won't be a lot of liquid left in. There still will be some, but there won't be a ton in here once we uh, once once they're ready. So um, yeah, we definitely don't need to stay till the very end, but probably another twenty minutes till they get nice and soft. Do you ever like whiz it a little bit? Sometimes when I make soup, I just whiz a little bit of the soup to make it. Big. Oh, you know, I don't normally do that while it's cooking, but with all of our soup and stew recipes from the, and stoop recipes from the book, um, we do mention that um, it's great to have the option of, of doing that when, when it's done because uh, some kids just don't like, some people, but some kids especially, don't love seeing little pieces of things. Um, Maurice's son, Gabriel, is definitely one of them. He says, I don't like stuff in it. I don't like stuff in it. So if he just sees like a, you know, a puree or something like that, he's perfectly fine with it. When he sees bits of carrot and onion, it freaks him out. So we would take this after it was all made and put it either do the, um, the what is that? The immersion blender? Immersion blender. Thank you. Um, or we'd put it in the, in, uh, in a regular blender, just like a bit of it and then puree it and give it to him over some potatoes or something like that. And he was yeah. good to go. Nice. nice. Yeah. So where's the best place to get this book? Oh, great question. So, uh, we know that, well, I think a lot of bookstores are opening, reopening now. So we're huge, huge supporters of your local bookstore. They are the book is available kind of wherever, wherever books are sold, but sometimes places don't carry it. If you live in a place with a larger vegan community, they probably carry it. But if not, um, you, you can have them order it. Barnes and Noble, you can have them order it. Um, if you do want to buy it online, uh, bookshop.org is uh, a wonderful organization that was keeping uh, small bookstores alive during the pandemic. And uh, they will find the nearest bookstore to you that carries it and they'll get it from them and send it to you. So it's supporting the local bookstore, but it's also the convenience of being able to order it at home. Um, or if you just wanna check online ahead of time before you go to a bookstore, if a bookstore has it, uh, you can go to indiebound.org and IndieBound will uh, show you the, you can put in your, your uh, zip code and they'll show you a bookstore near you that carries it, so. Maybe you, can that, maybe you can give me all that information for the show notes. And oh, yeah, definitely. I will. Be terrific. Yeah. So how can people support you, follow you? Are you active in any social media? Yes. Um, predominantly, Instagram is where I engage with people who I don't know personally. Um, if someone finds me on Facebook and follows me on Facebook, if I don't know you in person, I probably won't add you. And that's nothing personal. It's just how I run my Facebook. That's just like my personal place. But Instagram is public. 
And um, anyone can follow me on Instagram at Laura Delhauer. And uh, my website will be announcing the launch of the new website for the environmental theater group. We're called Naked Light is the environmental theater group and uh, soon to be nonprofit. And then uh, Hi Mom Monologues and the Characters of Climate Change is our show. So all of that information can be found either through my Instagram or my website, lauradelhauer.com. Well, it sounds great. It. it sounds like you're, you have a lot of creative things that you're up to. I'm trying. There was definitely a lull during the pandemic where cooking always stayed with me. I cooked throughout the entire pandemic and that was a wonderful creative outlet. But some of the other stuff, my heart was really broken. This is the longest I've been without being on stage since I was eight years old. Um, so that's been hard, but I'm really excited to get back to um, creative endeavors and collaborating with people in person. Although this has been wonderful too. I really like being able to do these kinds of collaborations. Right. Well, I can't wait to see one of your uh, comedy performances. Thank you. Yours as well. I have to check out one of yours. <laughs> a lot of, I put a lot of mine on YouTube when I can. Oh, well, perfect. Then I, I, I perform improv as well, but we don't usually put that on YouTube because it's a little bit different. It's, oh, okay. Well, I'll follow you to make sure I find out when your improv is because I, I, I love improv. Well, come and, take my class with me. Improv, that's one thing that's been great about the pandemic is we could do all these classes on Zoom so there was no interruption in studies. Oh, that's great. I'd love to take a class. I haven't taken improv in so oh, long. I'd love to take a class. It's my favorite. It's my favorite. I'm studying with the groundlings now. I love it. I love oh, it. love the groundlings. That's amazing. Oh, cool. You. Well, you're amazing too. And thanks for being vegan. And thanks for writing such a wonderful book for families. Guys, check it out. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for another great show.